Good morning and welcome. Good to see everyone here this morning. Looking forward to worshiping our great God together. We want to welcome you all here. We want to welcome our guests this morning. If you are a guest with us today, we're glad you're here. Um, you're important to us. We want to get to know you. If you get an opportunity to um, maybe click on the QR code here on the bulletin, fill that out, or look at uh, the, the pew in front of you, there's a little connection card. And if you fill that out, that really just comes to me and I'm able to just say hello and see if you have any questions or how we can help you um, with our church and moving forward. So we, we're glad you're here. We're, we're um, looking forward to meeting you and talking to you. So good. Wanted to let everybody know if you haven't looked at the All Things EBBC, I know some of you don't get that. Uh, the Matt and Casey, uh, excuse me, Cassie Farrens had a little girl over the weekend. So we're rejoicing in that. That was many years of praying and waiting on the Lord. But uh, a little Gwendolyn Alice uh, Farrens was born um, this, over the weekend. So we're rejoicing with the Farrens. So please rejoice with them. As we take a deep breath, as I take a deep breath, coming from Sunday school up here, we're thankful for that. We want to, I just want to recognize the fact that we come into this service with a lot of burdens on our hearts, right? In our lives, maybe struggles personally and different things. We want to be able to lay those aside this morning. And I just want to read a passage, a short couple of verses of scripture, of reminder. As we come in, that our minds would be cleared and that we'd be preparing for worship. But Paul in, chapter, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So yes, we have our struggles, we have our burdens, but we're looking to those things that are unseen, that are eternal, spending eternity with God forever, our merciful, gracious, loving Lord that we just sang about, right? So as we think about worship, let's give those burdens to him today so that we can listen to the word being preached and the spirit working in our heart. But before we begin our worship, I'm going to have uh, Miss Jackie Hall who's going to come, and she's going to share a little bit about our Secret Sisters ministry for us. Jack.
So if you remember that, but happy Thanksgiving. Jackie Hall is going to come up and, um, excuse me, Jackie Mace. See, there's that Jackie again. Jackie Mace is going to come up <laughs> and she's going to, sh- come on up, Jackie. And she's going to share our call to worship with us. So why don't we stand as we, uh, for the reading of God's word. Over this side. Psalm 103. worship. Um, I want, good morning, first of all. Um, I want to explain a little bit about the Mercy Ministry. Um, The Mercy Ministry of EBBC is like an umbrella with several spokes. They include meals via the meal train, visiting our sick and elderly, ministering by sending cards and praying, transportation, driving people to medical appointments, and also we need transportation for some of our elderly um, members who are not able to drive anymore. Um, We also have uh, helping um, with minor repairs and moving, et cetera, for our our members. We have a food pantry that's overseen by Adele Anthony and donations of non-perishable food products and paper goods would be greatly appreciated. We can help keep the spokes on the umbrella propped up by joining us in protecting each other um, when the rains come. So I thank you very much um, as a member of the uh, Mercy Ministry. Now we can read from Psalm 103 and it's on page 502 in the Pew Bibles. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all of our diseases, who renders our life from the pits, who crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He makes makes known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will always he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor pay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father knows compassion, shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O ye angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will, Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Rejoice in the Lord now and always. Sing it again, we rejoice.
Hey, good morning, folks. My name is Joe Muckle. I'm one of the elders here at East Brandywine Baptist, and I have the distinct privilege of leading us in prayer. Before I do so, though, I wanted to let you all know something. You might not know this, uh, but this is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. So um, I, I hope you all are now informed. Uh, now, you might say, Joe, I'm pretty sure this happened a while ago. And it did. I think um, universally it is celebrated back in October, but that coincided a bit with our mission celebration. So in a desire of not to take away from missions, we pushed it back to today. So welcome. Happy Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And uh, typically every year, we like to recognize and appreciate our pastors in a special way. Uh, they do a lot for us, both in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. Is that an expression in front of the scenes? They're here, they're just, you, you get it, you know, admin, a lot of stuff. And so we wanna take time to appreciate them. So I'm gonna have uh, all of our pastors who are here come up. Their lovely wives are welcome to join them. Uh, just come up here on the stage for, for a moment and we wanna recognize and appreciate you. Um, all, you all know Pastor Brian is currently on sabbatical and we do miss him dearly, but we did have an opportunity to, as an elder team, have breakfast with him on Friday and spend some time appreciating him as well. So rest assured, he is appreciated. These are appreciated. So much appreciation going around. Um, but I think there's a slide. Yes, can you see the slide? Can anybody identify or have trouble identifying who is who? You got it, DJ? All right, I believe it. I think the, the middle, the mi Can I just say one thing? Go for it. Pastor John hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> you haven't aged a day, Pastor John. We appreciate you. Um, the, I think Pastor Brian made a joke about the middle part in his hair. Um, thankfully, his, his hairdo has progressed positively since then. Um, but we, so the, I guess the theme is getting better with age, right? Uh, just, like a, just like a fine cheddar, uh, these, these pastors, looking back, have gotten better with age. Look at these handsome gentlemen now. Uh, what, a, what a blessing to have them as part of our leadership team here. Uh, they do so much when it comes to preparing for teaching, for leading, for guiding us as the flock, and we're, we're grateful, and we really, we really appreciate all the work you do. Um, I'm sure we could kind of think in our minds, I have a good sense of how much work these pastors do. You should probably add to that, and then you might get close to how much work they do. So we just appreciate the tireless hours, the commitment to fellowship, community. Um, there really aren't a ton of off hours for pastors, and we really appreciate that. Um, so we, we give uh, gifts every year. Every year it's a Pomodoro's gift card, and we've already given it to the Ostros and the Bulldogs in the first service, but I do have one for the Haases here. But just as a token of our appreciation, thank you. We so appreciate all of you, and uh, we're grateful to have you as part of our ministry. So please, back to your seats. Let's do a round of applause. Thanks again. And special thanks to Sandy for making it up in that scooter, too. That's impressive dedication. <laughs> all right, well, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are grateful to be here. We're grateful to be a part of this congregation. We're grateful to be able to gather here on a Sunday morning uh, to worship you, to learn about you, to sing your praises. We, we know that you are present, Lord. We know that you are here. Your word tells us where two or three are gathered, you are here. And we, we thank you for that. We're amazed by that because we know that we are not worthy of your presence. And yet you, you are here among us. You've called us to yourself. You have called us to worship, called us to serve. And unlike the, the prophets of Baal who had to scream out and gash themselves trying to get their so-called God's attention, trying to call upon that false God, Lord, you are the true God and you are the one who calls. And you've called on us to answer. And Lord, this morning, we hear you, we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you, Lord. What an awesome God. You have... You have made the table and are waiting for us, and we want to answer in worship, adoration, and praise. We recognize, Lord, that we fall short. We don't deserve the mercies you've given us. The do open door that you have opened to us, Lord, we are unworthy. Um, but we thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, with a repentant and humble heart, we'd like to spend some time confessing confessing to you corporately, quietly, Lord. So we're going to take a moment here and confess our sins to you.
Lord, we recognize that there really isn't enough time to confess our sins. And, and Lord, we pray that you would continue to open our eyes to the ways that we sin against you, that we might repent and draw near to you, being sanctified by your truth, Lord. Lord, we spent a few moments ago celebrating our pastors. We're so grateful to have them as part of our leadership team. We feel blessed by their, their service, their uh, time, the way they teach, the way they administrate. Um, we just pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would bless them as leaders, fathers, husbands, friends, mentors, disciple makers. Lord, there's so many ways that we would just ask for your blessings upon them. May you guard them, keep them from sin, grow them, draw them near to you. We think of Pastor Brian on sabbatical right now. We pray that it would be a time of true rest and growth for him as he prepares, as he says, for the next seven years of ministry here at EBBC. Lord, what a, what a blessing to have the pastors who are committed to your word and committed to biblical fellowship. We praise you for that. Lord, lastly, we um, would like to lift up to you the many requests that we have in our congregation. I think of the sick, the hurting, the depressed, the downtrodden, those that are in physical pain, emotional pain, um, spiritual pain, Lord. We just ask that you would relieve them. We ask that your presence would give them peace and hope. And Lord, we are, we're in a temporary moment of experiencing the impacts of sin in the world around us, but we know that eternity with you, there is none of that. There's only hope and peace and glory and joy and perfection. And we long for that, Lord. We pray that you would just give us that sense of longing deeper and deeper every day as we draw near to you. Lord, we thank you for being able to gather together. We thank you for the body of Christ. We pray that throughout the rest of this service, you'd be glorified in the reading of your word the singing of these praise songs, and the preaching of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us, How Deep the Father's Love.
Good morning. I just want to say thank you to you. Um, thanks for being so good to your pastors. I, I have a lot of friends that are pastors, and um, this church takes exceptionally good care of its pastors. So thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. And um, as a pastor students here, people ask me all the time, how's youth group going? How's your youth group? And it's a joy to be able to honestly say, like, we have incredible teens. And I love serving them. I love working with them. I love working in the kids' ministry. We've got incredible kids and families. So thank you. Thank you for letting us pastor you. And uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to open up to uh, Matthew chapter 5 once again. If you are new with us or, or maybe you're new to the Bible, we are in a series right now through the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are... Um, basically the opening statements of the greatest sermon ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, and because Jesus preached it on a mountain, that's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. So it's pretty simply named. And in the sermon, Jesus lays out what it looks like to be a person of the kingdom of God. So what do Christians look like? What what do they love? What do they look like? How, how do they think about themselves, about God, about others? What do they value? How do they live? What are the ethics of the kingdom of God? And now you might be thinking, you have to be pretty great to be a part of the kingdom of God. But actually, we've been learning the opposite's true. We've been learning that the people of the kingdom of God are actually convinced that they're lost and sinful and broken and in humility, they long to be made right. And last week, we saw that they long for a real Christ-like righteousness. Not external man-made religion, not rites and traditions that look really good. But instead, they, they long for real, genuine righteousness. And Jesus is teaching us in this sermon that there are three characteristics that really describe that kind of righteousness. And those are mercy a pure heart, and peacemaking. And this week, we're going to zero in on the first of the three, on mercy. So let's take a look at this. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we see your love for us over and over again in Scripture. We see in our lives how you care for us and you're merciful to us. And yet we sin. So, Father, by the Scripture that we read today, would you encourage our hearts? Remind us again of the mercy we have in Christ. And, Lord, as I teach, if there's anything that is not consistent with your will and your word, I pray that we would all quickly forget it, but Lord, if there's anything that comes from you by your spirit, would we understand it? Would our hearts meditate on it? And would we be transformed by it? I pray this in Christ's name, amen. So today is the Operation Christmas Child deadline. Did you know that? Okay, good. Um, each year, we as a church are really excited to participate in Operation Christmas Child. We, we make a bunch of shoe boxes. We have a team of teens that put those together. We fill them. Churches, hundreds of churches, thousands of churches across probably the world um, fill these boxes, and, and those boxes get shipped to be little, little bits of light to some really dark places. And so basically you have kids who, who don't have access to basic needs, right, like toothbrushes or books. And, and the shoe box opens a door then for a Samaritan's Purse missionary to go with the box and preach the gospel. Now, I just want to give a, a quick PSA um, about the shoe boxes. They're due today, and right after this service, we have a team of, of teens and youth staff that are going to take those over to Calvary Chapel in Chester Springs. And so if you forgot your box, um, please don't bring it this week. We won't be able to do anything with it just because the collection day is, the last day for collection is tomorrow. And um, so we won't be able to help you. So if you forgot your box, no big deal. They're open till four today for delivery, or you can drop it off tomorrow from nine to 11 in the morning. But if you did bring it, praise God, we're gonna, we're gonna take those over. Um, we, have, we have a team that's gonna take those over right after the service. Now, I wanna take a second and think about 
why Operation Christmas Child even exists. So, so why is there a need for ministries like Samaritan's Purse? Or ministries like Habitat for Humanity? Or Chester County Connect Care? Or our own Mercy Ministry, which Jackie told you about at the beginning of the service? Isn't it because we live in a broken world? There is pain and sickness and disease. There are wildfires in Maui. There are hurricanes in the Gulf. There are tsunamis in Southeast Asia. There are earthquakes in Turkey that kill tens of thousands of people. There's famine, there's hunger, there's starvation. There is deep poverty. Why is that? Where does all that come from? Well, the Bible is clear that all of that is because of sin. So when Adam and Eve sinned, All of creation fell with them. And the world now is not how God designed it to be. This this is why, after all, this is why we call it a fallen world. The world has fallen with us in sin. This is why Paul will say in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God. And and Paul says we groan too in a very real sense. All of the natural disasters, diseases, hunger, pain in this world is because of sin. But we could go further. There's a real sense in which suffering in this life, human suffering, can also be directly connected to specific sins. So I'm thinking of a dictator who abuses his people and they starve. I'm thinking of a company that is negligent with chemicals and hazardous waste and thousands of people get cancer. I'm thinking of a parent who spends their last dollar on drugs or alcohol and the kid goes hungry. So sometimes suffering is caused by other people's sins. Sometimes it's caused by our own sin. I think of a college student who cheats his way through his classes and ends up in a job that he's completely unprepared for and is miserable because of it. Or I'm thinking of a gossip who has no friends, no deep, real friendships, or a sloth who loses his job. Everything that is wrong with this world is because of sin on one level or another. But there's good news. Amen? There's good news. We serve a merciful God. We we serve a God who in his kindness is redeeming people from their sin and transforming them into little agents of mercy who then spread across the world. To be a Christian is to be someone who knows God's mercy, to to have tasted his mercy. And here's what happens to anybody who enjoys God's mercy. You become merciful. There, There is this connection. There is this connection where you are transformed into the image of Christ. And, and more and more, each day, you long for a world where the righteousness of Christ is the only reality. And so you, you participate with him in offering mercy to the broken and suffering and needy. Let me put it another way. It is inevitable that anyone who truly drinks from the fountain of God's mercy will then become a cool, refreshing pool of mercy. So clearly we're talking about mercy today. That is our beatitude. And I think... I think a helpful place to start is to just ask this question, what is mercy? Now, you've probably heard a phrase like this before. I've heard it many times in my life. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. You've heard that before? Okay, I think that's a fine statement. I think that's very true. But I think it's a little, I I always remember hearing that being like, what? (laughs) Like, that's good, but what? I think D.A. Carson's definition is a little better. Here's what he says. Mercy is a loving response to the miserable and the helpless. Mercy is a loving response to the miserable and the helpless. So because of of sin on some level, whether due to a fallen world or someone else's sin or our own sin, mercy is compassion for the helpless and the miserable. And it's, by the way, it's not just feeling pity. It's not just feeling compassion. Compassion that just sits there. It is mercy if it is compassion that leads to helping the helpless, that leads to to action. Mercy is compassion in action. It's not just kindness, and it's not just kindness to anyone. So, for example, if you were to give $1,000 to a rich man, 
Would that be kind? Maybe, sure. Would it be unnecessary? Absolutely. Would it be mercy? Not at all. Now, maybe that person still needs mercy. All right? Maybe his money has isolated him from genuine friendship. And maybe all he ever knows is people asking for a handout. And so mercy from him or for him would look like being a good friend and not asking for stuff from him. Mercy is compassion that leads to help for the miserable, help for the helpless. It is compassion in action. The point is, mercy is mitigating the consequences of sin, whether due to a fallen world, due to someone else's sin, due to our own sin. It is mitigating those consequences. And and I want to show you, go to Matthew chapter 8. I'd like to just show you a few places where we see the mercy of Christ on display in the book of Matthew. So after he finishes the the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes down the mountain, and great crowds are following him. That's normal in the book of Matthew. There are almost always crowds that just long to be with him. I hope that, that you long to be with Christ. And it's interesting. Here's what it says in verse number two. A leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Is the leper miserable and helpless? Yeah. Absolutely. And by the way, not just because of his physical condition, but socially. If, if you read Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, you, you find two whole chapters devoted to laws for leprosy. And perhaps the most understandable But sad rule is Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46. Let me read this to you. Leviticus 13, verse 45. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. So the teens love scary church games. This is like one of their, I think it's probably their favorite event. It might be their favorite event. They can tell you later. But one of the games we play is zombies. And the way zombies works is there are people that are zombies. If you get tagged, you become a zombie. But you have to act like a zombie if you're a zombie so everybody knows you're a zombie, right? You can't walk around and be like, all normal, all fine, everything's good, and then be, ah, right? You have to act like it the whole time. Essentially, that's what's happening here in real life. Like, they have to to live out that they are unclean. Unclean, unclean, stay back. And then it says this, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. We're talking about a man who has sunk into the deepest pit of loneliness. And not only does he have to wear torn clothes and cover his face and cry out that he's unclean, no one comes near him. He has no community. He, he's living alone, away from the community. And, and because he's clean, he's unclean. You can't touch him. And he can't touch anyone else. Now, I'm sure in a group this big, there are some people that would like that. Some people are not touchy people, right? If you have kids, like some of your kids like it, some of your kids don't, right? But I don't think any of us have gone days or months or years without physical human contact. A hug, a back pat, a high five, not even a fist bump, right? Nothing. And notice what Jesus does in our text. He heals him. He heals him, but he touches him. Question, does the Lord Jesus need to touch somebody to heal them? No, we have accounts of him healing people who aren't even near him, like across the other town. But he touches him. He didn't have to touch him, but he touches him. Can you imagine how overwhelming that moment would have been for this man? Not only is someone paying attention to him, not only is someone, someone healing this miserable skin condition, but Jesus touches him. That's mercy. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Two more pages over, probably in your Bible, if it's like mine. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is with his disciples. They're in a grain field. There was this rule in the law where they, the people weren't allowed to harvest every last little bit of grain from the field. They had to leave some for the poor and the hungry and the alien and the stranger living amongst them. 
And so they're going through this grain field and they're, they're hungry. And so what do the disciples do? They start picking grains to get a little snack, a little traveling snack. A little, this is like stopping at the convenience store, right? To get a quick beef jerky for your trip, right? They're just, they're getting a little snack. They're hungry. They're just munching on some grain, which if you've ever eaten grain, it's not like really great by itself, but they, they're eating it and it's filling them. Verse number two, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath. In other words, gotcha. Like we, they've been looking for a way to get them. We got him. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath because they're working and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have condemned the guiltless, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In the book of Matthew, the Pharisees are this constant picture of purely external religion, following rules upon rules, and, and I wanna be really careful. I want you to hear this. Does God desire his people to obey him? Absolutely. We glorify him as we obey him. He wants a heart that obeys him. Mercy is not overlooking sin. Mercy is not enabling sin. We're supposed to be doers, not just hearers of the word. Iron is supposed to sharpen iron. The problem with the Pharisees is that they are absolutely obsessed with the letter of their man-made laws, and they're completely missing the spirit of God's law. They, they had pursued righteousness, but they did it at the expense of compassion and, and care for the weak and the helpless. And that's not righteousness. And so what does Jesus say to him? He, he says to him, you don't understand the law. This is the Pharisees. Guys, this is the Pharisees. They've spent their whole lives studying the law. He's like, you don't get the law. Because if you got the law, you would know what God means when he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He's quoting Hosea 6.6 6 here. Now, if you know the book of Hosea, there's some real rich irony here that I want you to taste. You see, the people in Hosea's day, this is in the Old Testament, they're particularly wicked because idol worship is just rampant all over the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And it's so bad that God commands the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer just so that his life would be this picture, this condemning picture to Israel of their adultery against their God. I mean, they cheated on God with idols is basically what God is saying to them. They sacrifice to idols. They, they worship with cult prostitutes. The people in Hosea's day, kind of in this way, you could say they were very religious, Okay. They were very religious. Now, their religion was offensive to God, but they were religious. They did a bunch of ceremonies. They did rites. They had their rituals and their traditions, but God despised their religion. Listen to Hosea chapter 4. This is verses 1 and 2. God says, There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. They didn't love God. They, they didn't even know their God. They thought their God was a piece of wood. And because of that, listen to this, verse number two. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. This is a particularly dark time in the period, uh, time period in the history of Israel. And it's to those people that God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God desires a heart that is so consumed by love for him that it overflows with love and care towards the people around you. And in Matthew chapter 12, our text right here, verse seven, here's what Jesus is doing. Here's the irony. He's lumping in these ultra-religious Pharisees with the wicked people of Hosea's day. And he's basically saying, you're no better. He's like, he's like your ancestors were religious and you're religious. But their religion was detestable to God and your religion is detestable to God because like theirs, it lacks mercy that flows from a heart of love for God. He's saying to them, are, are we really talking about the fact that my guys just picked up a quick snack? Are you kidding me? 
In other words, religion without mercy is not righteousness. So you can come to church, you can dress right, you can sing the songs, you can give your tithe, but all of that means nothing without mercy. So someone who has tasted God's mercy in Christ, they will inevitably be merciful. You know, Jesus does quote this in another text. Go back to Matthew chapter nine. He quotes Hosea 6, 6 in another passage. So this is Matthew chapter nine. This is the text where, where Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple. Now, Matthew is the one who wrote our gospel. He was a tax collector. And you need to know that tax collectors are traitors and extortionists. I mean, this is amazing. Jesus calls him, like of all people, to be one of his disciples. And Matthew's like, I'm in. He follows him. And watch what happens right after this. Look at verse number 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. So the Pharisees look at these tax collectors and sinners. And just I want you to just think for a second. Don't, don't say anything, just, just think. What do they see? So when these Pharisees look at these sinners and tax collectors, Jesus is at the table, they're, they're eating, they're reclining, probably not sitting in chairs, probably down on the floor. And, and the Pharisees see that. Like, what do you think they're thinking? What do you think they're seeing? I think they're, they're seeing a morally inferior group who refuses to get in line. Now just take a second and think, what does Christ see when he looks at these people? He sees sick people who need a doctor. He sees sheep who need a shepherd. He sees sinners who need a savior. And so what does he do? In mercy, he moves toward them. So what do we learn about mercy? Mercy moves toward the sinner. Mercy is able to separate sin from the sinner, if you will. And and again, I wanna be really clear today. I'm I'm not saying that mercy is okay with sin. I'm not saying that mercy is enabling sin. For example, I'm not suggesting that a wife who's being abused by her husband should in the name of mercy just ignore it. Go to the police, get help. I, I actually think that would be a loving response to an abuser. Mercy is a loving response to the miserable and helpless. Mercy doesn't berate and ostracize. Mercy doesn't run away. Mercy also doesn't push away. It moves toward someone with kindness. And I wanna give you an example. For example, I wonder how a church might respond if a new couple started attending. And and the couple is just delightful, they're wonderful. They share their testimonies. They clearly know and love the gospel. Their kids start coming to youth group and and making some really good friendships and they're growing in the word. They even start serving in the church and the church is just thriving because they're in love using their spiritual gifts to benefit the church. And and it's both ways, right? The the, The church is edifying them as well and it's this beautiful thing. But then some of the members start finding out that this family immigrated illegally. I wonder how the Pharisees would respond. I wonder how the Pharisees would respond to that. Well, I think think it would start with gossip. Hey, did you hear? Hey, did did you know? Let me tell you something. And then I think it would turn into dirty looks. They'd probably tell their kids to stop hanging out with these kids. They definitely aren't gonna sit next to him in church and some of them might even start pressuring the leadership to make this family leave. That is the exact opposite of the kind of mercy that Jesus is after in our text. Mercy moves toward the sinner. Mercy doesn't run away from sinners. Mercy doesn't push away sinners. Mercy is a loving response to the helpless and miserable, to, to someone suffering the consequences of sin. Now, that doesn't mean that a church should approve of or even ignore their illegal status. The church should encourage them. The church should challenge them. The church should admonish them to pursue legal status. 
they should encourage them to honor the government of this nation. But mercy would do that with patience and with kindness, given how complicated and miserable the naturalization process in this country is. I wanna give you another example. Um, maybe you've noticed in the foyer, we have um, these little booklets. You guys seen these out there? There's like a rack. These are from CCEF. I love CCEF, Christian Counseling and Education Foundation. Um, man, they love the gospel and helping people with it. So um, they have a series that's called What to Do When. And basically it's what to do when something happens in your life and it's hard, right? So this one is called What to Do When Your Child Says I'm Gay. What to do when your child says I'm gay. And I just want to take a second and read some of Tim Geiger's, that's the author, Tim Geiger's points, because, man, it is so good. I, I want you to hear this. So his first point here is that you should acknowledge the courage it took to tell you. You know how challenging it would be for a, a child or a teenager in a conservative church to tell their parents that they're struggling with same-sex attraction? That would take a tremendous amount of courage. So he says, he says encourage them by, by ad, ad, admitting just how courageous they're being. Second, affirm for your, your love for them. Son, I love you. Daughter, I, I love you. And then he points out, that I love this, by the way. Geiger points out that it's completely understandable that a parent would be upset or fearful or confused if their child came up and said something like this. But I want to read, I just want to read this. Well, here's what he says. He says, your first instinct may be to find refuge in denial or anger, right? Run away or push away. You might wanna run from the situation or you may find yourself angry either at your child or at God. It's okay, I love this. It's okay to feel upset and rattled inside. That would be a completely normal response, but now is a crucial time to watch your words. You can say that the news is upsetting. You don't need to be stoic and put on a good face and pretend like you're above feeling deeply impacted by this news, but simply letting loose your pain, fear, and anger will only complicate and compromise your ability to help your child. So what he says is we wanna start a dialogue. Ask lots of questions. Ask where this is coming from. What, what do they mean by it? And as you're asking the questions, he, he kinda gives this phrase. I wanna read this for you as well. It's just so good. By adopting a grace-filled and compassionate response toward your child after the disclosure, the door is open to enter into his life and struggle redemptively. By not going on the offensive or immediately lecturing your child on why what they're doing is wrong, you will help diffuse his normal defenses to hearing what you have to say. Your child likely knows your position and he expects that to be your first salvo, but now is the time for discussion and dialogue. Continuing to build your relationship is the foundation that may eventually allow your child to hear what at this time he will not or cannot hear. And I love this. I gotta read this line to you. This is so good. To be life-changing, truth must come wrapped in the arms of love for the person you wanna reach. Amen. To be life-changing, truth must come wrapped in the arms of love for the person that you wanna reach. And, and by the way, this does not mean condoning a gay lifestyle. It doesn't mean you approve of embracing and, and pursuing same-sex attraction. Scripture is clear. It's, it's wrong. But this is mercy. And, and I often, when I think about our youth group, teens, like I wonder how our youth group would respond to a teenager who came and, and professed to be gay. My prayer and my hope is that they would taste and feel and see and enjoy truth that comes wrapped in the arms of love. Mercy, as an extension of love, it doesn't run away from sinners, it doesn't push away sinners, it moves toward them with compassion and tenderness. This is mercy. So that's mercy. Okay, that's what it is. The next question we have to ask is, how does someone become merciful? How do we become merciful like Christ? who touches lepers and feeds his disciples on the Sabbath and dines with sinners and tax collectors, uh, who dies on the cross for the people that rebelled and rejected him. Well, the Bible is clear it doesn't come from us. This kind of mercy is not our default. It's not our factory settings, if you will. And so we can't just muster up this kind of mercy. Like we might be able to... Uh, 
We'll be able to throw some coins in the Salvation Army box when everyone's looking. But we can't create this kind of heart of mercy in ourselves. So, so how do we become merciful? I think to answer that question, let's go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 7. We really need to figure out what Jesus means when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What does he mean by that? Some people look at that and and they say that those who are merciful will receive mercy from God because of their mercy. In other words, if you're merciful, then God will be merciful to you in response to your own mercy. Do you see that interpretation? That's how some people read that. That's how some people hear that. This view would say that mercy is our reward from God for our own mercy. There's two other passages that sound a lot like this. The first is the Lord's Prayer. Our Lord taught his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And right after it, he says this, for if you forgive others trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. That sounds a lot like what we're talking about. If you go to the other place, it sounds like it's Matthew chapter 18. And at the end of Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus this question. He says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? Like, that seems pretty, he keeps sinning, so seven. And, and Jesus says, 77 times. And what he meant by that was unlimited. Like, you're supposed to just keep forgiving. And then Jesus tells a parable. And this is called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Basically, in the parable, there is a king, and he forgives his servant like billions of dollars of debt. The point is, it's so much money that you could never repay it. It would take lifetimes to repay this kind of debt. So he forgives it. And then that wicked servant goes and finds one of his servants who owes him like thousands of dollars. And do you know what he does to him? He grabs him. He chokes him. I never saw, I I missed that when I studied it a few times. He chokes him. And he says this, pay me. And the guy's like, have mercy. I can't pay you. I I will. I'll, I'll get the money. And he's like, nope. And he throws him in prison. When the king finds out, he throws the first servant into prison until he can pay back his debt. When will he pay back his debt? Never. And then Jesus says this, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from the heart. So some people look at these three passages and and they say, man, Jesus has to mean that in order to be forgiven by God, you have to forgive. In order to get mercy from God, you have to to be merciful as as if that's the order of things. There's two huge problems with with making that conclusion. Let me give you the first. Look at Matthew chapter five. This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are who? The poor in spirit. Blessed are who? Those who mourn. Blessed are who? The meek. Who's blessed? Who, Who are these people that Jesus has been teaching about? They're these people who come to the Lord and in humility say, I got nothing. I got nothing to offer. I know it. I've seen my sin. I've seen how little I have. I have nothing to offer. God, would you give me righteousness? I hunger and thirst to be righteous. I have nothing. It would be completely inconsistent for then Jesus to say, those people think they can earn God's mercy. Do you see that? The other reason that this interpretation makes no sense is because it completely contradicts the rest of the scriptures, which Jesus knew and loved. Let me me read some of these passages for you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God's. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. I'll end with this one. All our righteous deeds are filthy, dirty dish rags. They're nasty and they stink. I don't want to touch them. You, You could go on and on. The story of scripture is that we have nothing to offer. 
So what does Jesus mean? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Jesus is teaching here that there is this inevitable connection between receiving mercy in Christ and being merciful. So why are these people in Matthew 5, 7, these blessed people, why are they merciful? Why are they happy? Well, they're, they're merciful and happy because God looked at them in their misery and in their helplessness and in their sin, and he showed them mercy. Knowing just how helpless we are and how lost we are, he sent his son to die for us. So will we only receive mercy if we're merciful? Absolutely. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll receive mercy because we're merciful. We're merciful because we've received mercy. Will the merciless on judgment day receive mercy? No. No, because they, they never received the mercy of the gospel that would then transform them to be merciful. Do you see what I'm saying? And let, let me give you an illustration. I, I think this might help. It might make it worse, but let me try. All right? Imagine that you wanted to be a fighter pilot in the Air Force. And so you start going through the steps. You meet with a recruiter. And in the process, you learn that you have to be tested for colorblindness as part of your physical to get into the Air Force. And so they do the exam, and the doctor realizes that, in fact, you are colorblind. And so the doctor says to you, you can't be a fighter pilot. Now, here's the question. Why can't you be a fighter pilot? Is it because you failed the test, or is it because you're colorblind? It would be completely reasonable for the doctor to say to you, I'm sorry, you failed the test, so you can't be a fighter pilot. But does that mean the ultimate reason that you can't be a fighter pilot is because you failed the test. No, you, you couldn't have studied for that test. You couldn't have prepared for that test. There's nothing you could have done to pass that test by your own merit. The only reason you won't be a fighter pilot is what? It's because you're colorblind. The test is just the evidence that you're colorblind. So in, in the same way, our capacity to show mercy is the test of whether or not we've received mercy in Christ. Our, our ability to forgive, Matthew chapter six, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 18. Our ability to forgive is the evidence that we've been forgiven. Our mercy is the evidence we've received mercy. So, so how do we respond to a text like Matthew 5, 7, this test? Well, it's a test, so let's take the test, right? <laughs> is your life merciful? Would your spouse say your life is merciful? Would your friends say your life is merciful? Would your enemies say you are merciful? Would your boss or your employees or your coworkers say you are merciful? And, and maybe you look at your own life and you'd say that you don't display mercy. And, and maybe for the first time, you're realizing that the problem is that you've never received mercy in Christ. Or maybe you have trusted in Christ. And you know it, you've put your faith in Jesus and your sins are forgiven and you're confident in that. But you still see some patterns of mercilessness in your life. In either case, the solution is the same. It's the same medicine for both problems. Recognize your sin and come to Jesus for mercy. This is the only way we become merciful. We cry out for mercy and you will receive mercy. That is a guarantee from the Lord. And, and as you do, as you enjoy this fountain of mercy from God, he transforms you into a pool of mercy to those around you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, a text like this convicts my heart. And I'm sure it convicts some of my friends too. So Lord, would you forgive us? Forgive us for all the ways that we don't show mercy, that we're selfish, that we're angry, that we ostracize, that we berate, that we push away, or that we run away. Oh Father, would you give us mercy in your Son? And Spirit, as we enjoy that mercy, 
would you change us into a merciful people? A people who are overflowing with generous mercy towards the people around us. People that are hurt and suffering because of a broken world. People that are struggling because of the consequences of someone else's sin or, Lord, because of their own sin. Father, would you make us merciful? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you could all please stand, we'll close by singing His Mercy is More. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday.